Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiecka, bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiecka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiecka. Welcome. I'm so glad you can join us on Mission Evolution, where we bring the latest knowledge from today's leading experts to support your evolutionary process. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll explore the mysterious human brain, evolutionary insights. After years of study, the extensive functions, location, and even the reach of the human brain remains a mystery. What all does it connect to? Does it have a role in spirituality and unity? Are there keys to the evolution of humankind hidden in the unknown recesses of the brain? With us this hour, with a unique perspective on the topic, is a lady we've had the pleasure of having on the show before, Dr. Jill Bolt-Taylor. Dr. Taylor is a Harvard-trained and published neuroanatomist with some profound firsthand experience. In 1996, she experienced a severe hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of her brain, causing her to lose the ability to walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of her life. Her memoir, My Stroke of Insight, documenting her experience with stroke and eight-year recovery, spent 63 weeks on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list. Her new book is Whole Brain Living, The Anatomy of Choice and the Four Characters That Drive Our Life. Her website, drjilltiller.com. Dr. Taylor, thanks for joining us on Mission Evolution. I'm excited to be with you again. Thank you for having me. It's it's always such a pleasure to get together. I I love what you're bringing. So let's start out, Dr. Taylor. What is a neuroanatomist? So neuroanatomy, neuro is uh, neurological tissue, so the brain and spinal cord, and anatomy is the anatomy. And I am a cellular anatomist, so I study the cells, who's communicating with whom, uh, with which chemicals, and in what quantities of those chemicals, and the overall brain circuitry of uh, that underlies every ability that we have. So what percentage of our brain do we currently use? You know, we use 100% of the brain. Um, Neurons are little living creatures, just like humans. We're very social creatures. And when neurons are cut off from other neurons, then they actually curl up in a little ball. They remain that way for a little while, and then they tend to die. So if it's alive and it's in your head, you're using it. So it is a myth that we only use 10% of our brain. I was wondering about that. I was going to say, my goodness, if we only use 10%, that's scary. (laughs) So we use all of it, but you were talking about neurons curling up and dying. What goes on there? Well, if there's some kind of trauma, uh, let's say there's a stroke and a stroke is when the blood supply, which is bringing oxygen to the brain gets cut off. Well, neurons, all cells thrive and breathe and essentially the food is oxygen. So if with a stroke, uh, my oxygen supply gets cut off, then I'm no longer being fueled and then I may die. So neurons, again, living beings, um, most of the brain cells you have in your head are the same brain cells you were born with. And that's why, you know, you can remember what it felt like 10 years ago to be you or what it felt like to be you as a child, because the neurons are, are really pretty much 99, 98% the same as the ones you were born with. So from a neuroanatomist perspective, what did the left and the right side of the brain do? Well, the, they're both made up of these beautiful neurons and the neurons are, are their mirror images between what's going on in the right hemisphere and what's going on in the left hemisphere. But the right hemisphere, essentially the neurons, they, they communicate with one another and then they communicate with more of themselves and then they communicate with more of themselves. So they are biologically Uh, structured to create a bigger picture perspective where the exact opposite is going on in the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere takes a group of neurons and they zero in, they zero in, they zero in. And so they're really good at defining detail. 
So, so that's one of the biggest differences is the right hemisphere goes for the big picture. The left hemisphere goes for the details. One of the other big differences is that the right hemisphere, it's right here, right now in the present moment. That's all it knows. It doesn't have a past. It doesn't have a future. So it's preoccupied with communicating about everything in the present moment as it's connected. And then the left hemisphere has a past and it has a future. So it thinks linearly across time. And with that, the third biggest difference then is me, the individual. I am. I am a detail of the information being processed at that cellular level. So I, my ego, my identity is actually located in that left hemisphere. So the left hemisphere, it's all about me. I'm the center of the universe. I have a past, I have a future, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for details and de more details. While the right hemisphere, it's not about me, the individual, it's about my connectedness to all that is in the present moment. So it's it's more of a connective than um, are are the, are the neurons different from one side to the other? I mean, you said they function differently, but are they actually? constructed differently? You know, there are lots of different uh, structures. Uh, we call these the morphology, the structure, cellular structure of neurons. There are all sorts of different kinds of neurons. So um, a neuron that is going to be a sensory neuron for hearing or for seeing or for smelling, they're similar to one another, but they're different. But sensory neurons are very different structurally than the big motor neurons that are, are used in order to have movement of the mouth, movement of, of any muscle inside of our body. So, so morphologically, there are all these different types of neurons. They're beautiful. I just love neurons. They're really like beautiful little friends. And um, But the thing about the way the two hemispheres are organized is that a comparable structure, morphology, morphological group of cells in one hemisphere is the same in the opposite hemisphere. And so essentially they are competing with which one will be inhibited and which one will then be expressed as dominant during any moment of time. But that's why, say, for example, again, if, if someone should have a stroke and I should wipe out a group of cells, I have a comparable group of cells in the opposite hemisphere that may, I may be able to train to take over that function if these have died and are no longer available. You had a severe hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of your brain. Would you mind sharing that experience with us? Yeah. So uh, as you can imagine, it was probably, it was quite thrilling through the eyes of a neuroscientist to actually wake up. I was 37 years, uh, years old. Um, I was in the prime of my life. I had a malformation in the blood vessels in the hemisphere of my left hemisphere, in the cells of my left hemisphere. And uh, over the course of four hours, I had this hemorrhage, this group of cells exploded. And over the course of four hours, I, I just got to watch my own brain completely deteriorate in its way in its ability to process information. So after four hours, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life because of the cells in that left hemisphere had completely gone offline. But I still had, I was still conscious. I was still uh, aware and awake and available, but all I had was the present moment experience. So I lost me, the individual, I lost my past, I lost any understanding of the future, and I lost all, all time other than the experience of right here, right now. I lost language. Uh, I just, I, I didn't know what a mother was, much less who my mother was, but I was still conscious and I was still processing information in the present moment. What did you, as a scientist, learn from that experience about the operation of the two different sides of the brain that may not have been common knowledge before? You know what? Uh, uh, it, first of all, isn't it interesting that a brain scientist ha actually had this experience? And um, I think what I gained an awareness of what was, is what is actually going on in that right hemisphere. What does it feel like to be in the present moment, the experience of the present moment? And what is the thinking tissue doing and how it becomes connected to all that is? 
And in normal language, in our normal understanding before this experience happened, we would talk about, if you think about Carl Jung, the famous psychologist, we would think about the four archetypes. And we all have these four very distinct personalities. But in his language and in his understanding, because he was a normal human being, one of those personalities was conscious and rational. And that was the left thinking portion of our brain. Well, I lost that part of my brain. So I didn't have that anymore. I didn't have uh, the, the emotions of my past or of my future. So I lost that part of what he calls uh, the, a part of the unconscious. And all I had were these two consciousnesses that he considered as unconscious. So because of this experience happening to a neuroanatomist who understands how the brain and the neurological system has evolved over time, now we now we can say, okay, well, what's actually going on in those unconscious portions of our brain and bring them into our consciousness. So then we gain, we can gain the ability to actually pick and choose who and how we want to be in any moment, because now we know all four characters that we're working with. We can develop them. We can create a line of intercommunication with them. And in my opinion, that's why I'm talking to you. This is the evolution of humanity You, based on the uh, neurological machine and system that, that we all have to work with. So you said we use 100% of the brain, but it sounds like we don't consciously use 100% of the brain. And you're talking about engaging consciously with it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, well, uh, you know, so many of us think that our emotional reactivity circuitry is uh, is unconscious and and it doesn't have to be. I'm really clear in an instant when that circuitry gets engaged. And because I am a neuroanatomist and I think in terms of cells and circuitry, then every ability we have, we have because we have cells that are performing that function. And then we can just learn about about the anatomy of the brain, learn about the anatomy of the circuitry, learn about the groups of cells inside of our, of our brain and how they interact with one another in order to result in four very distinctive archetypes or uh, the four characters, as I call them. Now, going back to your experience of the stroke and your recovery, did you uh, reaccess your memories and all of that stuff? Or how did that work? Because you all of that was offline for a while, yes? Right. Uh, so I had a hemorrhagic stroke where I had a blood vessel explode. And on the morning of the stroke, uh, the blood clot was about the size of my fist. And then over about over uh, within a, a few weeks, um, it dried out to be about the size of a golf ball. And then I had surgeons went in and they removed this blood clot that was the size of a golf ball pushing on my tissue. And once they removed the pathology, then it was like, well, we have no idea. My doctor said, go away. It's going to take be two years before we really know anything about what you're going to get back or not. And I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. So I was essentially an infant in a woman's body when they sent me out of the hospital. So over the course of eight years, I used what I had in order to rebuild the circuitry. Because again, I'm a neuroanatomist, I think in terms of cell systems. And so I could relearn, I, I still had a visual understanding of the circuitry inside of the brain, but I didn't have any of the terminology because language is in that left hemisphere. And so I had to relearn the terminology and relearn, okay, circuits that have gone offline. What do I need to do? What are the obstacles standing in the way of me being able to do something again? And then, uh, but I had limited amount of energy at all because I was, I was, you know, my system was traumatized. I was, I was exhausted all the time. Um, but that's all I did. My entire focus for uh, an eight year recovery was, um, uh, what could I do? What could I not do? What was standing in the way of me being able to accomplish the next step? And then uh, at the end of eight years, um, uh, I declared myself as 100% recovered because I had every ability back. Phenomenal. How much of regaining your ability had to do with engaging the other side of the brain to do what the, what the uh, damaged side had done prior? 
Oh, well, I existed in the consciousness of the present moment. That's all I had. I had no past. I had no future. Uh, Jill Bolte Taylor, the scientist, that woman, she died that day. Uh, her memories, her thoughts, uh, her understanding of reality, her education, everything that the left hemisphere had processed was gone. But all that my right hemisphere had learned. And, you know, fortunately, we have these two magnificent hemispheres that work together in conjunction. So I was, I was not just a neuroanatomist, but I was a gross anatomist. So I taught um, a cadaver lab and I love the human body. I mean, it's just this magnificent thing. And so even within months after my stroke, I could have sculpted for you an abdomen and everything, all the organs and how they relate to one another. But I couldn't have told you the three different parts of the stomach because that was language that I had lost in the left hemisphere. So I was very fortunate that although I lost the consciousnesses of my left brain, I still had this magnificent right brain. Brain and all of its its characteristics and and knowledge base. So um so so you know I used that uh, that knowledge in order to rebuild what. I thought I wanted to get back language, for example, in our society, we communicate through language. So it was very important to me to be able to become fluent again in language. Well, that's a big job yeah, because lay, you know, all I could do was grunt and moan. Uh, I didn't have words. I didn't, I had silence, absolute silence in my mind because uh, you know, you turn into language, you turn on, on on the radio of the language, and then you're thinking in language. Well, I didn't have any of that. I sat in a, oh. an absolutely silent mind for five weeks and talk about, you know, being, being enveloped in the spiritual experience of bliss and euphoria. Oh my gosh, it was beautiful there. So, so I decided I would use as much of me as I could to regain enough of my left brain to be able to function like a somewhat, you know, neurotypical human being, but I would never stop. I would never uh, go away from the new value structure that I had gained now dominance as my connection to all that is. Phenomenal. Well, we're coming towards the end of this segment, but how does that relate to what, you know, your monks and all these people that isolate themselves into the silence? Does that, does that explain why that practice well, the practice that they use is designed to calm and quiet their left brain so that, yes, they can open up the consciousness of their right hemisphere and exist in the peaceful euphoria of the present moment. And But I'll, I'll tell you, you know, being there is a completely non-functional state. So to me, that's why whole brain lean is so important come from the value structure of connected to all that is come from that blissful euphoria let that be a goal but use this magnificent left hemisphere in order to create a peaceful euphoric world within which we all can live and share so it sounds like that you once you came back you were you said dr jill died well you were a totally different human being I was. Um, the value structure of whom I was before was the details of anatomy, the details of climbing the Harvard ladder, the details of my life, um, all of that, everything that had to do with me, the individual. But in the absence of me, the individual, now my priority is we, humanity, and our relationship with one another, our relationship with this beautiful planet that we live on. And uh, boy, do do we all have our, our work cut out for us based yes, on the natural polarity of what's yes, going do. on? Well, it is time for that promised break. On the other side, we will go into what does it mean to be unified, to be we instead of I? Dr. Taylor and I will return very shortly, so don't go away. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org.
Do you enjoy paranormal, sci-fi romance, yet find yourself tired of the same old themes and storylines? Then you won't want to miss Kahir O'Donnell's latest exciting release to taste you again. Alien Lord Kane McKean knew the moment that his destined mate was born. He watched from afar, waiting for her to grow from child to woman. However, before she was old enough, she was stolen from her home world by flesh pirates. Kane searched ten long years to find her held in a suspension chamber, a ten-year-old girl in a woman's body. He rescued her and swore to give her time to grow up, but with his very life depending upon winning her as a mate, has he waited too long? Get your copy today. To Taste You Again by Kahira O'Donnell is now available on Amazon or KahiraO'Donnell.com. Accosted in her bed and abducted by aliens was the last thing Michelle expected, yet the fateful morning of her destined death changed everything. Lord Lan Ramos, Alpha King of Vidar, the monstrous befanged alien looming over her bed, was her destined mate come to save her from certain death. He is a telepathic mute shifter. Can Michelle accept him and his animal? Once on Lan's home planet, Michelle becomes increasingly psychic, revealing her as the fabled Oracle of Vidar. As factions conspire to destroy them, will they overcome mounting threats? Will Michelle's growing gifts save them or ultimately destroy her? Don't miss this sci-fi shifter romance with charismatic and engaging characters. Get your copy today, The Oracle of Vidar, available on Amazon or kahiraodonnell.com. That's C-A-H-I-R-A-O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L.com. Hello again. This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. We're dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. With us this hour, bringing deeper understanding of the human brain, is Dr. Jill Bolt-Taylor. Her website, drjilltaylor.com. Dr. Taylor, we were just starting to talk about the unifying properties that are that are to be found once you disengage from the I, I, me, me focus on small details and go into a more expansive place. Do you think that it's we've been conditioned to uh, focus more there, just out of the way society's been? Um, or is this something that we need to learn to do? Uh, well, obviously, we need to learn to do it. Or is this something that we still have the capacity to really do, is to enter more into the expansive brain? You know, we are, uh, by scientific method, we are designed to experimentally do things methodically, which by definition is, uh, you know, the left brain world. Um, and we are skewed as a society to the values of what's going on around the me and the I and the mine. Um, where am I on that hierarchy of, you know, I w always want to be higher. I always want more, uh, be that a uh, better position in my job or more money or a bigger house or blah, blah, blah. So the value structure of the left hemisphere is about me, the individual and mine and me constantly wanting more. The value structure of the right hemisphere is connection in, 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 a, as a neural network, truly. So um, uh, just based on where we have come as humanity, uh, we have really skewed to the value structure of that left hemisphere. And we support that with our science. And now, you know, as you look at the world and you look at the polarity between uh, the different political groups, they actually, you can take them back to the value structure. Uh, one group caring more about me and mine and have me getting more and more and pushing the other person down. And then the other, uh, how do I use my tax dollars in order to uh, 
uh, support those who are less well off than I am and how to bring them into the, 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 a better, a better whole. So, you know, it, it's, we are as humanity, a reflection of what's actually going on at a cellular level. And right now we are just at a time where we have this incredible polarity between the two hemispheres and the evolution, the natural evolution of humanity will be this interconnection of becoming a whole brain instead of a left brain dominant or a right brain dominant society. So we've, as a culture, become pretty doggone narcissistic and detail focused. When you speak of that interconnectedness that's also available, does that involve the brain reaching further than the physical body? Well, I think that every ability we have, we have because we have brain cells that are performing that function. So if we are capable of an experience, we are having that experience because there are brain cells that are designed to to be the tool through which we have that experience. So if, for example, if, if we're capable of some type of paranormal experience, well, paranormal is, is parallel to that which is normal. And, and, you know, isn't that really what's going on inside of the right hemisphere? The right hemisphere is beyond the boundaries and the definition of what we believe to be true or know to be true or worthy as that left hemisphere. So, so I, uh, you know, all I can say is, is we are this magnificent collection of cells and uh, because of the way our, our brain has been skewed to the value structure of the left brain, it defines, well, paranormal can't be real because we can't measure it. Well, but, but that's denying the existence of something that, that is biologically happening in relationship to people. So instead of saying, no, it's not real or no, we can't explore it. It's like, let's see, well, what is it? What can we observe about it? How can we relate to it? How can we train ourselves if that's what we want to strengthen that part of ourselves so that those cells actually can have a a stronger voice in the existence of what we are as humanity. So the the brain is, works on electricity. Is that, am I correct there? I mean, it's simplistic, but is that it's, it really all boils down to chemistry. Um, even the electrical experience is a, if I'm a neuron and I'm going to communicate uh, with my target tissue, it's a flip-flop between sodium and potassium at a, a microscopic level, but it happens so rapidly that we call this an electrical current. Um, but uh, because, because it is in its own weird way, but mostly we're atoms and molecules. Um, and, and that's why that environment of the cells is so critical because if say example, there's a hemorrhage and blood gets into that space between the neurons, then it's, it's interrupting that electrical, uh, exchange between the potassium and the sodium at a a microscopic level. So yes, technically we are both electrical and, uh, chemical. So the, the, thing I was trying to figure out or understand is I know from firsthand experience that we can experience things from other people's field. Um, you know, get hits about how they're feeling without looking at them, tell when somebody's in trouble at a long distance. How does that happen? Do, do you have well, it's energy? I mean, you're, you're, you're describing the energy field. I mean, you have to consider that, that if I'm a molecule and I, um, uh, I'm a, I become a genetic molecule and I'm spinning a certain way, then ultimately if I manifest as an organic structure, if I take atoms and molecules and put them together and I come up with something, I might create a lemon. But if I take those same molecules, but I twist them energetically the background the other way and they create something organic, then they would create a lime. So, so we're looking at atoms and molecules that are in motion, but the motion is the energy. And so, you know, when it comes to consciousness, we're trying to figure out and understand how much of the consciousness is actually in the energy field and how much of the consciousness is at, at the, the anatomical level, the atomic level of the molecules. But, you know, we as human beings, we're the manifestation of life. And so what is life? Life is nothing without the energy 
energy field and life is nothing without the matter that makes us up. So we are this magical combination of the two. So when you can detect someone's energy field, oh yeah, there's a book to be written on each one of us as we greet one another, right? And, um, and, but we do have some say over our own energy field based on which groups of neurons we are putting the energy into. And that's why I just love this human brain so much, because essentially it's, it's not just cells in communication with one another, but it's the energy fields and dynamics that get set up as those circuits emit themselves as each one of us as individuals. And wow, aren't we this magnificent collection of 50 trillion molecular geniuses? I mean, we're not a single microbe, right? We're magnificent. So um, as we evolve, do you see that we have a possibility of gaining more, I hate to say focus and detail, but more control, I guess, over accessing those more esoteric realms, those more esoteric uh, parts of other people. Yes, whatever we practice will grow. So if, uh, uh, you know, any ability that, that I have or that I don't have, um, I, it's the exact same thing for my recovery process. Um, I had no language. I had no, I, I mean, I had absolute silence in my brain. I didn't have a grunt. I didn't have a groan. I, didn't, I had no sound. And so I had to turn, I had to work to turn that circuitry back online in order to be able to have language again. I had to turn vision back on in order to, uh, to have three dimension. I had to turn on sound in order to be able to differentiate between between different tones so that when people spoke to me, I could actually differentiate between different sounds of different words. Um, and, and that's the, the same thing, except those are things in the left hemisphere. So what's going on in the right hemisphere? Can I learn? Can I train myself to, to better understand body language and what the big picture of a human brain, being is presenting themselves Absolutely. Can I also focus in on, on, on facial recognition or facial uh, languaging? Absolutely. And then who's to say that there aren't these other entities, these other pieces of capacity that we have not trained ourselves as human beings because we have skewed all the focus to my relationship with the external world as opposed to my experience with something that may be greater or beyond me. Fascinating. So I'd like to bring this to the pavement. You have learned a lot uh, that wasn't known before. And I understand that you've learned about what, what do you call it? Four characters of the brain. And by using them or understanding them, each of us can start to evolve as human beings. Would you mind going into that a little bit for me? Absolutely. So when you think about the evolution of the mammalian nervous system, it works by, let's say I'm a species and I'm working out all the kinks between all the cells so that I have stream flow of ability. And then in the creation of a new species, new tissue gets added on top. So the difference between reptiles and mammals is the addition of limbic tissue. We call it the limbic or emotional tissue. And so that's what makes mammals. And it's bilateral, some in the right hemisphere, some in the left hemisphere. And then what happens between a typical mammal, other mammal, and then the human is the addition of new tissue on top, which is our thinking tissue. So what makes a human unique is now we have this emotional tissue below what is our thinking tissue in each hemisphere. So the evolution of humanity is working the kinks out between the new thinking tissue on each side with the emotional tissue located below, as well as the relationship between these two now thinking masses of cells inside of each of our hemispheres. So when I speak about the four characters, I speak about the thinking tissue in the left hemisphere. I call that character one. The emotion tissue in the left hemisphere, I call that character two. 
the emotional tissue in character as character in the right hemisphere is character three, and the thinking tissue in the right hemisphere as character four. And I call them the characters because when I lost my left hemisphere, I wiped out my character one and my character two, which is all about me, the individual. But what I gained was an untethered, uninhibited character three, the emotion experience of the present moment, and then the thinking that is open and expansive and beyond the details of me, the individual. So we end up with these four characters that have completely different personalities, completely different skill sets, completely different abilities, and we do have the power to choose moment by moment which of those four characters we want to be at any moment in time. Well, that sounds like <laughs> we're multiple personality, but we can we're not we can choose to be conscious of it and bring forward whoever is the most expedient for what we're trying to accomplish at the time. Exactly. Well, I do want to address the multiple personality because technically it's multiple personality disorder. And this is not to say there is, you know, as a brain scientist, my area of, of specialty was schizophrenia, uh, uh, bipolar disorder, panic anxiety disorder. These are real alterations in the way a normal brain is wired. Um, but the four characters, these are the four arch archetypes that we all have. So at a biological level, we have emotional tissue in the right hemisphere and in the left hemisphere, and we have thinking tissue in the right hemisphere and in the left hemisphere. So these four characters actually end up being the four archetypes that Carl Jung has spoken about, except we can bring them into conscious awareness instead of experiencing them as parts of our subconscious. So how do we work this? So uh, character number one. So we all know these parts of ourselves. Character number one, this is the part of us that is rational. It's organized. Uh, it defines me, the individual. It has language. It becomes an expert. It likes to control people, places, and things. Uh, it likes to have, take its stapler and put the stapler where the stapler belongs because it wants to be able to know where to get my stapler when I need it. So this is a part of us that goes to work. I call mine Helen. I, it's short for hell on wheels. She gets it done. Um, she's busy. She's, she's the boss. She runs a to-do list. Um, and um, do you recognize that part of yourself? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. She cares that my outfit matches. She cares that I put on my earrings. She cares about all these details about me, the individual, as I present myself to the external world. So that's character one. Character two is left hemisphere emotion. Again, it's me, mine. It's all about Jill Bolte Taylor. I have an ego. It's about my past, anything that happened in my past. So my past trauma is going to be in this tissue. My past joys and pride and, and times of pride are going to be in this tissue. But again, so so this is a part of myself that, that it actually takes information out of the present moment experience, which is the realm of the right hemisphere. And it says, is there any reason based on my past experience that I should say no or push away the what's happening in the present moment? So this is my automatic no. Um, it can, uh, this is, this is the pain of my past. So, uh, it's my fight flight, uh, freeze response. We all know this part of ourselves. Um, and this is all of my childhood pain. So this is really important information because, because of my childhood pain, I don't have to reinvent the wheel in the present moment. It's like, no, I had that experience. I created a healthy boundary that is no longer going to be a part of my current present moment moment because I've learned from the past that that's not good. At the same time, because of that, this is where my growth edge comes from because this is when I actually look at something that hurt me in the past and I said, no, I'm going to push it away. And it's like, but that was 30 years ago. I don't have to be afraid of every dog that looks like that dog that bit me 30 years ago because this isn't that dog. So character two, it is my pain from the past, which opens up my doorway to self-protection as well as my own personal growth. So character two is really important for us to be able to take our traumas from the past, explore them, reflect upon them, but we're not designed to make a lifestyle.
out of them. And so it, that's, it seems like that's that's where a lot of people get stuck is coming from their damage and from the trauma that character two is carrying versus making different choices and moving forward. Exactly. That's exactly right. And it, it's critically important. Um, you know, it, we have to go back and we have to reflect and we have to look and see what worked for me, what didn't work for me. Why didn't it work for me? Can I grow from this experience? And it might be, no, I'm going to slam the door closed. But it's kind of like, well, it's kind of like personal healing. If I'm sick and I put all the energy into the illness, then the illness will grow because energetically I'm using my magnificent mind to focus on the illness so the illness can grow. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is I want to focus on the 99% of cells that are healthy and strong and powerful. I want to empower my immune system so that, that they can go in and they can create wellness from that illness. And whether it's an emotional focus or a spiritual uh, energetic healing uh, focus. It's a matter, matter of how do I use the focus of my ability of what I am as a human in order to bring health to me, whether that's an emotional health or a spiritual or a physical health. Well, in order to um, learn more about the four portions of the brain, that's in your latest book, isn't it? Yes. Whole yes. brain living, the whole anatomy of living. choice and the four characters that drive our life. And it's beautiful material. Well, we're about out of time. Jill, I have to ask you quickly, what is your mission? Oh, my mission is to, to be the peace I want to see in the world. Oh. That's my mission. I want to bring love. I want to bring peace. I want to bring health. I want to be well-being. I want to bring celebration of what we are as this, these beautiful conglomerations of, of living organism and and uh, I want to be able to, you know, when I'm when I'm laying in my own uh, last moments, I want to be able to look back on that life and say that was a well-lived life. And it will be a well-lived life, I can tell already. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are out of time. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Oh, I so appreciate you. I enjoy your company. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our guest this hour has been Dr. Jill Bolt-Taylor. Dr. Taylor is a neuroanatomist. Her latest book is Whole Brain Living, The Anatomy of Choice and the Four Characters That Drive Our Life. Her website, drjilltaylor.com. This has been Mission Evolution with Gwilda Wiecka. For more information or to enjoy past archived episodes, visit www.missionevolution.org. Please be sure to join us right here next time as this mission continues, bringing information, resources, and support to an evolving world.